It's time for the Roos, White & Blue CFL podcast. But before we begin, for those just listening to the podcast, Joe, what am I wearing? You are dressed up. You got yeah. a nice shirt and tie on. And a tie! That's right. We're going to be talking ties on the Rouge, Wet, and Blue podcast and all those other games in Week 10 and Preview Week 11. Coming up next on the Rouge, Wet, and Blue. Welcome to the Rouge, White, and Blue CFL podcast. My name is Oz Davis. I'm the host of the show. And joining me, as always, is my co-host, Mr. Joe Pritchard. Joe, how are you doing this week? Good. Uh, I I would have to say you're very committed to the bit. I mean, it's what, 4 <laughs> o'clock in the morning where you're at? <laughs> well, I'll tell you what. This is only from the neck up, this shot. So... <laughs> It's not like I'm wearing slacks, man. I got on I got on some nice comfy sweats. But yeah, first thing in the morning. Yeah, I was committed to the bit. Uh, you got to love the tie. I'm probably the only person in the United States who is a fan of gridiron football and who enjoys the tie. I do enjoy the tie. We finally had one. It was like it was like waiting for the rain, right? The clouds have been rolling in for a few weeks now we had a couple of close calls on the tie but finally we get a tie in the cfl but probably the most important story of the week in the cfl came from outside the cfl uh nathan rourke former i don't know how can i describe him former mop level quarterback in the cfl with the bc lions um Got to play in the NFL preseason week one game. Went three of 13 passing. <laughs> this was released from the Atlanta Falcons. Pretty much what? I don't know, what did this take? About seven minutes, Joe, for the BC Lions to re-sign him after that? Maybe even less than that. <laughs> and what I was seeing, they were talking while he was on waivers. from. The oh, yeah. Minutes, so... If okay. he wasn't picked up, he might have been going then. But mm -hmm. Atlanta was chasing him in the offseason, too. Had put in a claim before the Giants did. Mm -hmm. Ended up taking a chance, taking a look, and going, hmm, I think we're good. <laughs> right. Right, right, right. Um, wow. I, as soon as I saw that he had been uh, you cut, released by the – Atlanta Falcons. Uh, I was just thinking, like, who's gonna who's gonna pick this guy up? And uh, I'm kind of shocked that BC got to him. Now, is this these players are up for grabs, right? You leave for the NFL, mm -hmm. you're absolved of all contract obligation, right? So I think there might be a tie in there again. Like, if you're under contract and you leave during the NFL window, like your team gets first crack back at you. Oh, but Nathan Rourke's a Victoria kid. He was going back to BC or nowhere. So really? You think so? Yeah, that's exactly what happened. It's, okay. BC doesn't necessarily need a quarterback this year. Do they? Except when Nathan <laughs> comes knocking on your door and saying, I'm home. What are you going to do? Yeah. Well, I mean, good time. Good time for him to show up. 
anyway, uh, with Vernon Adams being out and Jake Dolagoa not exactly filling the bill there in BC. So, wow, nice pickup for BC. Yeah. Uh, and, I kinda, on, and I pick on BC from time to time about not having killer instinct. Well, maybe not on the field, but off the field, they sure have yep. it. Yeah, the front office does. Yep. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice. Oh, okay. oh, and their video team, too. They're fantastic. <laughs> right. Yeah, yeah. Good call. Good call. Um, okay, so BC, looking pretty scary in the West. Um, this week in the CFL, <laughs> four teams finished the game with without their starting quarterback. Let's say it's four out of eight. Okay. Now, question for you, Joe. Did Oz Davis start one of those four quarterbacks in fantasy football? If what you're anything you like me, yes, yes, you did. Uh huh. Uh huh. Did you get the same one? Trey, were you going with Trey? Ford this week? Yeah. Uh -huh. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> well, We'll, we'll, of course, get to this later on. But, hey, Trey Ford looked great there. Started six for six for 96 yards. Uh, nice start. If he had continued that through the game, he would have had about 400 yards and been about 24 of 24. <laughs> so, but unfortunately, Trey was out. Uh, Trey got knocked out of the game. One of the four quarterbacks who did this week. We'll be talking about those uh, later on in the show. Uh, all right, let's see. And um, the only thing I wanted to say before we begin, I've been wanting to say this for a few weeks because I really felt it there a few weeks ago. Watching TSN, okay, the, the pregame show, the halftime show, whatnot. Now, I don't want to begrudge anyone a vacation, okay? But this show really should include friend of show Milt Stiegel. And this show really sh must include Kate Burness. I mean, Kate is the glue on this show, guys. We need her there. Like, I want her there every show. Like I say, I can't, I can't begrudge anyone a vacation. But wow. You really miss it when Kate Burness is not on that show. I mean, she's like that that tight end when you're playing NFL fantasy football who's number one tight end and, like, number two is, like, ten rounds lower. That's Kate. That's Kate. Because whenever they bring on a sub on this show, you can – it's a different show. It just the, – the whole dynamic is different. So I just wanted to say that because this has been on my mind for a few weeks. Um I don't know, Joe. You got any feelings about the TSN? I, I was gonna, I was gonna say what you're saying sounds a lot like what I say about various CFL teams and plucking and playing different <laughs> different players. You can have all the talent in the world, but if you don't fit in where you're put, it doesn't work out work out as well as if you're put in a position where you're most likely to succeed. So mm -hmm. I could see exactly what you're saying. I say it all the time. There you go. The TS the TSN halftime show is a team sport. Right? We need those key players in their positions. All right. Okay. So starting off the week was the tie. Saskatchewan Rough Riders 22, Ottawa Red Blacks 22. Um, often on this show, the Rouge, White, and Blue CFL podcast, we like to exhort our fellow Americans who are fans of the CFL about turning their friends on to the game. And, you know, oftentimes it comes up like that uh, Montreal-Calgary game a few years ago, 40-37 to 37 in overtime. Uh, Winnipeg's had a couple uh, this season and last season where, you know, it's a real framework of a game. It's a real exemplar of the CFL. Well, this was not one of those games, okay? Unless, unless your buddy is a special teams enthusiast <laughs> because until the overtime every highlight play seemed to be coming from the special teams and this is even without mario alford doing anything right? mario alford couldn't do a thing now maybe this was you know the fact that it was raining pouring the whole game 
So it was really tough to get anything going on the offense. But on the Riders' side, they forced a fumble from Devontae Dedman, improved their field position uh, on a very bad drive on the punt return, and blocked two field goals. Two field goals. That gives this special team three blocks in the last three games. Okay? So they were pretty awesome. Really, really put that game into overtime by blocking those field goals. For the Red Blacks, I mean, Richie Leone might have been the MVP, the, the MOP of this game, uh, especially if you include the coverage teams. Richie had seven punts, three of which went over 50 yards, and one 80-yarder, which might be the longest punt in the CFL this season so far. Um, so, I don't know. If you like special teams, this was quite the game to see. Bit of an odd game. Didn't you think, Joe? What, what were your impressions on this game? Mm. Really, the only thing I can even remember from the game is the last <laughs> three minutes in the overtime and just how much of a colossal mess it all was. Yeah, it was a bit of a slog there. Yeah, this is this this is the exact opposite of those games that you want to want to show your friends. If you showed your friends yeah. this one, mm -hmm. sorry. <laughs> well, again, again, you know, if you like special teams, man, this is a highlight reel. This game, this uh, again, this this game was 13 13 going into overtime. Uh, so you know, again, not a lot of scoring there going on. Um, I don't know, you know, just kind of assessing the game, the riders' rushing defense after getting torched last week did pretty well. I mean, they weren't really ready for Dustin Crumb. Uh, they kind of knuckled down in the fourth quarter. On the other hand, uh, Rykel Armstead was nowhere. He had 12 carries for 20-some-odd yards. Um, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. 12 of 23. That's the number I have. And, I mean, you know, this was a guy who, who whipped off 98 yards in the first half against the Owls a few weeks ago. Okay, so the real problem here uh, – I'm sorry, this is uh, – <laughs> I've lost my train of thought. This one right here is Frankie Hips. I was going to say that while the Riders' uh, rushing defense looked great, the rushing game is nowhere. <laughs> you know, now some of that might be the weather, but Frankie Hickson wasn't that great last week either. Frankie Hicks wasn't that great last week either. Uh, this week he's going 12 of 23. Um, the consequence for the Riders not having a running game is that here you have Shea Patterson throwing 49 times in the game and going for just 299 yards. I mean, this isn't Jake Mayer here, but he ends up looking like Jake Mayer. You know, 6.1 yards per attempt, three picks, you know, against two touchdowns. Um, on the other half, of course, I mean, what else are you going to be talking about as far as Ottawa is concerned in this game, except for Drew Brown going out? Um, this poor guy, I mean, on the injury, he wasn't even hit straight on. He was just kind of run into <laughs> by Miles Brown uh, of the Riders. And, well, we don't know how long he's out, do we? Has he been put on the sixth game? I haven't seen it. I don't know exactly on that one. I do know Jeremiah Mazzoli is starting next week, though. So. Yes, that's right. That's right. They have they have the depth to weather a storm there. It's a, uh, mm -hmm. the problem being is you don't really want to have to do that if you don't have to. But I mean, if you have to reach down to your third string and pulling out Jeremiah Mazzoli, that means you did pretty good stuck in the cupboard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But one wonders. I mean, it's to that point now where it might be too little, too late, at least to win the East. Uh, Ottawa's got to stay in contention in this thing. Look, there, Montreal's halfway through the season, and Ottawa's five points back on the table. Sure, they're but looking if you're Ottawa, second place looks pretty dang good considering what you've been doing. So, yeah. On the other hand, though, Joe, they're only they're looking back at a one point advantage over Toronto. So, who still can't seem to figure themselves out. So, Ottawa's in a bit of a shaky place this week. Thankfully, there's still Hamilton. So Ottawa will likely make the playoffs, at least. They're still well in playoff contention. Should be penciling them in right now. 
but it's going to be unfortunate that they're going to. And I think they're out of the running for number one already. Uh, they, they're going to have to be concerned about number two because, for example, game two of the week was Toronto Argonauts 39, Calgary Stampeders 25. Oh, my God, Joe. What can you tell me, man? I've got to stop buying into these stamps. Calgary was on the road. <laughs> I mean, didn't we discuss this last week? Yep, yep. That was the thing. Well, look, here's the thing. That's right at the top of my notes. It's like, I've got to stop buying into these stamps. On the other hand, the bookmakers thought this was a one-point game, right? Um, Calgary was somehow up at half, 15 to 7. Um, and on top of that, you know, uh, Toronto comes out and on the first drive of the second half, Kadeem Carey falls. You know, but then pretty soon it was all over after that. Toronto knuckles down. This one was completely sick. Uh, Calgary apparently just completely fell apart on this defense. In the fourth quarter, okay, Toronto scored 18 points, all right? They did this on 11 plays from scrimmage. The offense took 11 snaps in the fourth quarter, and somehow this team scored 18 points. Now, I – again, these are the two teams – that have been completely baffling this season until you look at the home away split in the case of Calgary. These two teams have been completely baffling. I'm not at all sure what to make of this second half meltdown by Calgary about this, you know, pulling magic out of the hat on the part of Toronto, who was nowhere in the first half of this game. What to make of either of these teams? Are either of these teams as good as their record, Joe? Calgary is about where they're supposed to be. Four and five. Yeah, yeah about there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Toronto is obviously dealing with having lost their franchise quarterback for half a season. And they're still treading water, which is pretty good considering that it was a completely self-inflicted wound losing their quarterback like that. Mm -hmm. So they shouldn't be too, too upset to find themselves where they're at. I mean, wow, it's just just a stunning loss here by the Stamps. Just absolutely no reason. I mean, the, the, the Toronto passing game was something like 150 yards. I mean, and, and somehow they, they, they lose by two touchdowns. It's just like, mm -hmm. wow, wow. I've really got to give up on these Stamps. <laughs> I don't care how good the stats are. It's kind of like Bo Levy Mitchell, whose stats had been looking great, but Pretty shockingly in this third game, Montre Alouette's 33, Hamilton Cats 20, uh, Hamilton Tiger Cats, I should say, 23. I don't know. Okay, so, you know, I have here my notes. You know, I could be talking, I could be bragging again how awesome the Alouettes are, about how awesome the defense is, about how the Tiger Cats didn't score a touchdown until the fourth quarter when it was already 26 to 9. We could talk about Charleston Rambo <laughs> just having a monster game. Six yards, six catches for 124 yards and two touchdowns. Jesus. But despite all this, the, the, the story was about the move by the Tie Cats. Um, here we go. Here's the sequence of events in the first quarter for the Tie Cats on offense. Okay. First snap of the game, offsides. <laughs> Second, a fumble by James Tuck. I mean, at least Bo Levy completed the pass. All right. All right. Al, let's score the field goal. Next, next play, delay of game. <laughs> okay. Completion, completion, holding by the offensive line, interception. End of Bo Levy Mitchell. Now, okay. I wasn't expecting this. I wasn't expecting Bo to get pulled this quickly. Because, again, his stats are pretty good. I mean, he's like the second high this season, almost by default, among quarterbacks in fantasy football points, right? So, 
And I mean, okay, shaky start to the game. Two tuner, two turnovers on the first two drives. But I mean, did you see this coming this quickly, Joe? No, but clearly that's been percolating in the back of Scott Milanovic's, Scott Milanovic's head for a while. To have that kind of a quick hook, you almost wonder why he didn't just go, just say, "Okay, fine, yeah. we're we're not going anywhere this season. Let's see what we have from Taylor Powell before the game." If he was yeah. going to make the move that quickly, mm-hmm. but was... I, I kind of, I almost kind of see it as he's because the interception Bo threw was a pretty bad one. Yeah. You know, oh yeah. The interceptions come in different packages. Tip ball, all of a sudden it's in a defender's hands. Fine. Contested ball down the rail, 50-50, and the defender comes out with it. That's another thing. Uh, trying to do a mid-2000s Brett Favre and just chuck it into coverage. <laughs> uh, less than stellar. Right. And, and it was one of those that just had Malinovich go, this isn't working. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, I mean, he threw it right to him. Yeah. He threw it right to him. Kind of like yeah. a rage quit. Like yeah, get this. Let's <laughs> let's see what let's see what's behind door number two. <laughs> Rage quit. I love it. Um, okay. Um, right. Yeah. I mean, and and what was wild too is on that second drive, they were in the no huddle offense. It's just like what? I mean, it was almost like Milanovic was the you know, sink or swim time here. All right, Bo, you want to start here. Yeah. You figure out these defenses, right? And, of course, it's Montreal. So, you know, basically the most unpredictable defense to play against in the league. You don't know who's coming at you. So it was pretty wild. That's very surreal. Um, So Taylor Powell did well enough, I suppose. But before this game last week on the show, I was saying, you know, if if the Ticats lose this game, they could be done um i mean there is there isn't really a short-term future for these guys is there joe no because that's what you're saying when you're when you're benching believe i mitchell to go to taylor powell it's mm-hmm. okay what we had going wasn't good enough let's see what else we can do which doesn't speak well for the way you set things up in the first place so mm-hmm. at that point you're just trying to see what you got for next year no, I'm not going to say that they can't make the playoffs. I mean, anything's possible in the CFL, but when you make that kind of a move, especially that publicly mm. and that emphatically, mm. you're telling yourself that you're not likely to make it. Yeah. It's just too big a hole. It's just too big a hole. It's the same, it's the same problem that Edmonton is looking at. You know, Edmonton can score 33 points a game the rest of the way if they want to. They're still not going to make the playoffs. And it's just, it's just, you, you start in, in these seven loss holes and it's just like, mm. it's, it's, you, uh, again, if you can whip off 11 games in a row, great. Okay. But I don't think. Great. Then why didn't you do it in the first place? <laughs> exactly. I don't think, I don't think Hamilton or Edmonton has the stuff here. Uh, maybe, maybe if Hamilton had gotten, you know, uh, maybe if they had, if 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 they had gotten, um, oh, Nathan Rourke, hey, <laughs> okay, we'd be talking possibility of play playoffs, but we can't now. Uh, speaking of those Edmonton Elks, the week closed off with Edmonton Elks thirty three, BC Lions sixteen. Uh, I guess for the Elks again. I feel like the story should be Javon Leak just having another ridiculous game. 134 total yards and a touchdown. Unstoppable to the point where you're wondering why they're just not giving him the ball every time. Um, I guess as an Elks fan, you're really happy they didn't throw this one away after Trey Ford gets knocked out, I mean, after the third quarter, I mean, they let the Lions get to 1916. Mm-hmm. You know, with Jake Dola, and Dolagalo. Then they dominated the fourth quarter. Right, right. They finally ran away with it in that fourth quarter, which is very un Elks this season, including probably the best drive of the season, the seven and a half minute drive for the touchdown in the fourth, which just 
that put it away, right? And exactly the way you want to do it. Really control that clock. Really control that ball. I mean, they were able to move at will with BC. Now, that's, I, you know, again, I kind of saw the doom and gloom on BC's part, um, along with wondering just exactly where this McL- McLeod Bethel Thompson was all season. Can there. You- he just didn't, he wasn't, <laughs> put in the position to hold a lead he was a right chase right 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 and i i don't know if he was clicking with his wide receivers this time he did throw that very ugly pick and uh didn't seem like there was a lot of interaction there with his teammates after the plays but um i, I you just have to look at bc bc is is zero and three now in the last four weeks with a minus 43 point differential. Okay. Um, yes. Okay. So we're bringing in Nathan Rourke. Okay. No, Vernon Adams has been injured or playing hurt or whatever, but I mean, the truth is this team may have other problems. Um, sure. they're, mm-hmm. they're giving up way too many points here on the passing defense. They're giving up way too many points this season. And whereas before they could get away with it, they can't right now. Now, I don't know. Maybe Nathan Rourke will turn this team into a 40 point, you know, 40 point a game team again. All right. But you're yeah. playing with fire here. You're it playing with fire. Absolutely represents hope, though. I mean, you went from. Sure, of course. Of course. You went from running the division to in the span of like three weeks letting winnipeg back into a semblance of a race anyway which right given where winnipeg's been the last five years is probably not the best thing you could have done Mm -hmm. on the other hand now you're just like okay now we have reason to hope not only this year for the gray cup this year but now we can look at our future and go it looks pretty dang bright really good morale pick boost this the timing of this couldn't have been much better Yes. Now, right. can you play safety? <laughs> Probably don't want to do that, but at the same time, you're right. There are other problems. They're going to have to mask those other problems or outscore them. They have a hope of outscoring them. We've seen this team put up points by the bunches at times. Uh, you weren't going to get that with Jake Dolagala. He is now going to be somewhere else, if anywhere else. He was released today. Um, Vernon might have been able to do that, but now you have a one-two punch at quarterback too that gives you some insurance for this year's run. Mm-hmm. Worry about the future in December. Go get it this year. Well, yeah, that's the thing. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, that's a good point about Winnipeg. Last week we talked about how BC has just had this infuriating tendency this season not to be putting the riders away. Well, here this week, well, this season, the rider, season, the riders, or <laughs> yeah, this week the riders took the tie, so they're the ones not putting BC away, and now somehow BC is undisputed number one in the West, you know, despite playing like this the past month. And well, so, at least that's the perception. We'll have to see, yeah, uh, because I did see a, a callback. BC had the same situation about 20 years ago, right? Wow, <laughs> you had. And and I've seen other people mention it today, which is what brought it to mind. Casey Printers had that fantastic season. Now, I'm not making Mm. a direct comparison, but he had that fantastic season, went down to the NFL, was on a practice roster, came back, and just wasn't the same. Dave Dickinson was the veteran who had taken over in his place, and he kept everything rolling at that point. Mm -hmm. So... Mm -hmm. Um, I, I honestly, for the CFL's sake, I hope that's not we don't get a repeat of that because Nathan Rourke playing at the top of his game is utterly fantastic for the league. I want to see that again. I do worry about that because you know he's been away for a couple three years and he's just been on practice squads. Well, you know, and, only, and- oh, they say he was only gone a full season. 2023. Is that it? It seems like a long time. Yes, because... Oh, yeah, that's right, because he was injured in the second half of... He was injured in the second half of 2022, came back for the playoffs, uh, didn't have a great game in Winnipeg for the West Final, but, like, what quarterback has in the last five years. Uh, (laughs) 
Went and took a shot at the NFL 2023, couple of rosters. 2024 was on a couple of rosters already. Uh, he had a pretty good tour of the NFL camps and just decided, you know what? I'm going to play. I'm, I know a place I can play. Let's go home. I actually had something prepared this week for, hey, let's not tell Nathan Rourke what to do. Let's let him pursue his NFL dream if that's what he wants to do. <laughs> yeah. What he wants to do is go back to Vancouver. Great. Right. Glad for him. I'm glad he made the choice on his own and didn't feel like he was forced to. Yeah, 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 yeah. It just just didn't feel like being a a practice roster player anymore. And, you know, after after the one game, after the one quarter, basically, in Atlanta, no one's going to give him that shot. Four different rosters. He yep. had a couple of nice preseason games last year in Jacksonville. He's yep. on New England's roster cup for a yep. cup of tea. Giants well, he at least yeah, he closed out with the Patriots last year. Yeah, yeah Giants pick him up in the offseason, decide they don't want to take him to the preseason. And right. you know, had been trying to get him and, and when the Giants got him and took a look and went, nope, we're good. I well, mean, you can't, you've been through four camps at that point. It's like the yeah. chances of you sticking somewhere that you're really going to feel comfortable are no. probably not great. Well, some guys did it. Some guys have done it. You know. mm-hmm. uh, Bethel Thompson. Bethel Thompson was on practice squads for three years, I think. Yeah, and, and Chris Trevler had a few had a few right. looks, but he yeah. got, he got he got a he got some playing time in both yeah. Arizona and with the New York Jets. So yeah. Just yeah. different situations where they needed the help, as opposed yeah. to the places where Rourke ended up going. It just yeah. overloaded every and single. It, spot. It's odd too about who exactly the NFL keeps around in these spots. Uh, you know, of course, Streveler had been picked up by an NFL team the year after he was back up, and Winnipeg won the Grey Cup. Um, whereas, you know, here's Nathan Rourke, you know, a stud from the CFL, but, you know, you look at that, you look at that game film and, you know, he's too small. He's too small. That's it. That's it. And that's the whole thing about the CFL. It's a league of guys who are 20 pounds too light or three inches too short for the NFL. Or just happened to be on a roster. Get, get got a look on an NFL roster that had six guys for five spots mm-hmm. and the other five guys were drafted. So, <laughs> right. Well, I mean, Strevler Strevler looks more like an NFL quarterback. He's not nearly as good as Nathan Rourke, but he has a closer build. Projectable like skills. Positively, yeah. Right. Yeah. But, but you know, Rourke has skills, <laughs> so well, I mean, nice we, we've back. even we've even done that that song and dance with Doug Flutie for what twenty years, right? right? Right, right, right. That was the thing, and yeah, you look at those Flutie highlights. Um, you look at him playing uh, in his early career in the NFL, and then you look at him, you know, drop kicking for the Patriots there in that last game in the NFL, and wow, you can just see how much bigger the NFL players have gotten, you know, in that 20 year span. It's wild. It's wild. I mean, he was viable in the NFL in the eighties. He was the stud of the USFL. He was, in the viable. 80s. He was viable at the end of his career too, until he got to be about 40, 42. Yeah. 42 I mean, but he was so small, dude. He was so small. Yeah. I mean, he had to do that thing where he was, he'd throw the pass and then he would jump up in the air just so he could see. You know, if, you know, where it had gone, you know, I mean, he was just at the end, he was just compared to those other guys. Right. Moral of the story is that if you don't have the NFL build, you're going to continue to find roadblocks. Whereas if you've got the build, you're going to have some of those roadblocks pushed out of the way. Yep. 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 At a certain size. Skill is slightly less important than weight. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, okay, so now, Joe, you've got something else on the Elks, okay? And I would like you to drop this story because I don't think I can do it and maintain the language for a family audience. I don't know so if I can, can either. 
<laughs> All right. Well, let's get through it together. So, short, short, long story short, the Elks are getting a new owner. They're going from public ownership for, what, 75 years or so to private because the last five years have been awful for them. They can't win on the field. They're not drawing fans. They got to make a change, right? Well, new owner come, comes in. Dustin Nielsen tweets yesterday about the new owner potentially wanting to change the name back to what it used to be. Really? Jesus. Jeez. Confirmation comes tonight from Dave Naylor talking on the sports cage. Source cage, I believe, um, Regina show, and just say, yeah, they're looking to change it back or shorten it to shorten it to esks to kind of go in between the two of uh, what they have now and what they used to have, and That's saying that the league aren't would most likely not step in step in the way of it and let it happen. Wow, no joke, really. Like, I know. I know we wow, love our that's... retro stuff, right? We're, we're, <laughs> we're one of our sponsors. Right. right, uh, right. We love retro, but we like it because, you know, it's fun to look back at the past, but also, don't you want to leave the past in the past? Yeah. Yeah. Come on. I mean, you know, there's this... a reason there was a change made in the first place. Exactly. And now, I think it's, I think it would, honestly, it would have been worse never to change it at all. Than to have made the change, oh. and then walked back the change, because now you're acknowledging, yes, there's a reason we made the change, but we don't. Care. But screw it, yeah, screw it, yeah. And that's the it. nice way for me to say that. Wow, wow, yeah, that's wow, that's nuts. I mean, okay, so you know, this was a bugaboo for me for forever. Okay, you know, I just these these team names, these okay, and and here's the thing, okay, you have levels of these things. They're all wrong, okay, but you have levels, okay? First off, you have the admittedly quite rare racial slur. Okay, that has no that has no purpose. That has no reason to exist. Okay? That Washington football team name yeah. All right. On the second level, you have teams like the Cleveland Indians. All right. Uh, the real offender there was the mascot, <laughs> this grinning, idiotic, you know, ostensibly native guy. Um, what is it? Chief Nakahoma, something like that. That was the Braves. Uh, oh, that was the Braves. Okay. Yeah. The Indians was just the. Which is the, proof that this is not an isolated incident right 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 and so and so with the indians the problem with that team name is it's just a reflection of the ignorance of that maniac christopher columbus who thought he was in freaking india why does this word even exist in our vernacular anymore it really doesn't it's going out and so why do we need this as a team name and then you have the third one where you're just naming your your team after a bunch of people often in the east of the United States of people that you have wiped out, <laughs> you know, or at least put on the brink, you know, teams like the Florida Seminoles <laughs> and like this. Well, here's the Eskimos. The Edmonton Eskimos are one, are one of these categories. It's just like turning a people denying a people agency and turning them into mascots you know, turning them into entertainment it's really a step back and this thing couldn't be worse right because as you're saying yeah you're saying we acknowledge the history but screw the history we don't care the other bad part is you've got yahoos on twitter saying the reason why this team is losing is because of the name change. They're going to get this name change. This is the CFL. So teams' fortunes change, usually within a decade. Team can be on the bottom and on the top in the, seven, in the same 10-year span. These fans are going to be saying, see, 
we changed the name and we're winning again. You know, and by the way, screw a bunch of people who used to live here before we came. <laughs> you know, it's yeah. just like uh, I mean that that's kind of been admitted. Be worse. From, that's and we haven't even heard from the new owner yet. Right. Uh, I think the press conference is what Thursday. I think, okay. but it, it it seems like it's easy. It, it, the way it's being presented through what we're getting, connecting the dots. It seems like what the message is, is it's easier to get back the fans we lost by Jesus. doing this than by putting a winning product on the field. Because we right. can do this. Putting a winning product on the field is hard. So uh, we'll get there, but let's let's get some cheap. Let's get some people back in the seats a cheap way first. Wow. Wow. That's, and that's I, the connection to drawing, right? Exactly. Exactly. And it's just like, it would be, I, I can't decide what's worse in that situation. Uh, honestly, honestly, because of course you want to see people going to these games, especially in the first half of the season when the weather is still civilized in Canada. Um, you know, you want to see fans at these games, but Jesus, I mean, that's highly cynical that if they change this name back to this awful thing, you know, that would get people to go to the games and watch, you know, a fair to middling football team. Come on. Come on. You're like, you're darkening my picture of Canada here, folks. <laughs> this can't be true, can it? Yeah, I can. In any, in any case, here, you know what? And I want to talk about this, acknowledging the past and stuff. All right. First off, let's give a shout out to our sponsor, RoyalRetros.com. You know, they've got retro gear of defunct teams and defunct leagues. You know, we're talking anything from Football Canada to the ABA and the Negro Leagues and Major League Baseball. Okay. If you enter the promo code RWBCFL, you can get 10% off uh, just for listening to this show and going to Royal Retros. It's a great place. Lots of great stuff to buy. But I'll tell you what defunct team names you can't get, Joe. Cleveland Indians, you cannot get at Royal Retros. You know why? Because <laughs> that's why. If you have to explain it, you know, you don't get it. Okay. They also don't have any Washington pre football team stuff. They don't have any Edmonton Eskimo stuff at RoyalRetros.com. They do have a lot of stuff that's worth remembering like gear by the Seattle Pilots and St. Louis Browns, uh, Spirits of St. Louis in basketball, and Las Vegas Posse in CFL football, and things like that. But they don't have retro named after, you know, your racist or semi-racist team names. Sorry. Sorry, guys. But good for Royal Retros. Keep it clean, guys. In any case... Let's talk next week's game. Now I'm starting to get heated up here, and it's way too hot here to be, like, working myself up this early in the morning. Yeah, especially since you're still in your dress shirt, so. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna adjust the fan here so you get a little air going while I heat up. Okay, so uh, next week, again, full slate of games. Haven't hit that Labor Day weirdness yet. So four games this week. However, uh, before we talk about the teams that are playing, Toronto is on by this week. And uh, so probably Chad Kelly is going to be at practice and uh, playing in week 12. That's I, I don't see any reason why not. I mean, they. it sounds like they're going through the process of saying, hey, did he complete all this stuff that the league wanted him to complete? Yes. Mm -hmm. I haven't heard yay or nay if that's going to happen you know how that's going to go down if there's going to be an extension to the suspension because the suspension was for a minimum of nine games but i mean just given what i've seen out of the league this year i can't imagine he sits for a 10th game because you know that would show that they actually give a damn <laughs> wow yeah wow I mean, I'm just sitting here thinking about the diversity of strength shirt that's sitting in my uh, drawer, and I'm kind of just wondering if those were empty words at this point. Yeah. Probably would. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. I mean, people people can change. Now, now, 
Chad is coming from a pretty low point, so we'll see. I mean, the man himself hasn't made a statement in months, so we don't know. Uh, no, I, but I, I know I, what that organization has done. I mean, it's clear that if there's an independent investigation of the problem. First day of training camp, Chad Kelly's standing there. It's like, yeah, you guys don't care at all. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, gee, getting dark here, getting cynical yeah, on this. I've, yeah, I've, I, I've made my peace with the fact that it's just not what I thought it might have been. So uh -huh. Uh -huh. we got football to talk about, though. So let's talk about yep. that. Yeah. All right. Yeah. We'll be uh, in Montreal. We'll be happy to see Chad again. We'll beat him again. No problem. Uh, all right. So the week on the field begins with Ottawa Red Blacks and presumably Jeremiah Mazzoli at quarterback, as Ben said, three and a half point underdogs at Calgary, who is still undefeated at home. Now, um, the last time these two teams faced each other, Ottawa had probably their best game of the season. Uh, 33 to six. That was the week eight. That was the Pimbleton game, basically, mm -hmm. when Pimbleton took over. And uh, that was the only game this year that Jake Mayer did not finish after, after averaging just five yards per attempt. Wow, did Ottawa make Calgary miserable in that game. I don't know. I, I have a hard time believing Calgary is going to win five in a row. I like Calgary less and less every game I see them, I, I feel like. Uh, they keep burning me. <laughs> um, Jake Meyer, it, it has come to, you know, I, I feel like now. Jake Meyer's superpower is that he doesn't get injured. <laughs> you know, it's just like, this is not an awesome quarterback. But week after week, he's playing 60 minutes. You know, week after week, he's in the game. And his completion percentage is pretty good. But again, a team like Ottawa, the way that they flooded that secondary, that middle level on that high level, against Calgary last time, makes me think they're going to win again. I'm going to take the Red Blacks. So. I'm taking Calgary. Okay. I'm taking Jake Mayers, my fantasy quarterback, because of the Wow! Chaos. Because okay. of the chaos that's been around the league yeah. as far as quarterbacks go. Mm -hmm. Like, you're right. He's the only one that I could trust to start the game and finish the game. I finish the game. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, I mean Nathan Rourke, I don't even know if he's in the fantasy game yet. He's fresh off of coming from the NFL. Maybe give him a week or two before you, th before you throw him in your lineup and forget about him. Mm -hmm. uh, what? Taylor Powell? McLeod Bethel Thompson because it looked like Trey Ford might be hurt for the week. Probably see Trevor Harris, but he's been first game back from six. Montreal's had their own issues. Um, gosh. Uh, and then Jeremiah Mazzoli in Ottawa, who hasn't really played a lot in the last couple of years due to injury. So, I mean, really, by process of elimination, let's go with that. <laughs> Not even Trey Ford? Not no, he might, he might be, he might not play. Wow. See, I was assuming that Trey was going to be back, but I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, okay. Well, I mean, if you're going with Jake Mayer, Joe, um, you know, uh, I'm uh, once again in fantasy football, I'm living vicariously through your team. So I wish you luck. I hope it doesn't turn out like it did last time against Ottawa because man, Ottawa baffled him last time. In and if so, it's what it is. I, I yeah. just, I'm not going to pick Zach just for a simple reason that I feel like a homer every time I do. So, <laughs> right, right, right. Zach is the other one, right? Zach is the other right. one. viable, viable quarterback. Uh, hasn't been having a lot of good fantasy games this year, though. So, no, and a lot, the, a lot of the a lot of the touchdowns get taken on, taken from him with tackles yep. at one, and Strebler takes it in, and. Yep. <laughs> Yep, yep, yep. Um, that's how that's worked for like three or four years now. So, yeah, uh, between McGuire, Prukop, 
Strebler. That's just how the off bomber offense goes. Get to the one and then plunge it in. Well, yeah, you should. You should. You can't. I mean, you saw what happened when Vernon was doing it earlier this season. Oh, yeah. you guys, you guys get shredded on that. You got to have the the guy built for that play. Yeah, which is one I, of the unique. I have, and I have nice no things. complaints about that as a strategy whatsoever. It just. Oh yeah. It's a great oh, fantasy yeah. play. So yeah, it's a it's a nice thing about um, the CFL. Yeah, I like it. It's one of those differences in the CFL that you have this specialist. You know, you have your short yardage quarterback specialist. Now, I like that. I like that. It's a nice, it's a nice Canadian a football thing. Um, okay, second game. And wow, I think you would have to be a little bit foolhardy to bet this. Uh, Montreal Alouettes, one point favorite at Saskatchewan. All right, we've got a whole ton of storylines here. If Fajardo comes back, this is the first time that Cody Fajardo and Jason Moss have played in Regina since leaving the team. If you get Trevor Harris back for Saskatchewan, I believe this is the first time he's played against the Alouettes since going to the Riders. So we've got some interesting things going on here. I'm taking Montreal because, again, I have pledged to do so in Pickham all year for the rest of the season. Uh, but I don't know. I keep I keep fearing the loss. I mean, it's got to come. The Owls are on a 16-2 and two pace. I'm not sure that they're actually going to finish the season like that. So the loss has got to come somewhere. Could it be here, Joe? I think so. Um... Okay. I like Saskatchewan's quarterback situation slightly better right now. Really? Uh, because if Trevor Harris does, doesn't make it all the way back or can't go the whole way through, Shea Patterson's been enough. I mean, he's not blowing anybody away, but you're not going to just crater your offense by going with Shea Patterson. So there's that. Um, I believe um, Alexander's had some family issues, unfortunately, and – nothing oh really yeah just oh, wow i think i think it's i think it's illnesses in the family so oh. he's yeah and then Fajardo may or may not be back it's just with your top two quarterbacks and then your third being um dominic davis instead of caleb evans at this point it's just i, yeah. I i'm a, and on the road in regina out west in regina i mean it's not. It's not the. It's not the easiest game Montreal is going to play for the rest of the season. And if you're going to go fifteen and three, you lose three. So <laughs> this one uh, feels like one of those they could lose and not feel all that upset about. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. Well, I mean, Fajardo has been practicing, right? Even last week, even though he wasn't active, he was still on the practice field. So. Mm -hmm. He might be, it's not like he'll be coming in freezing cold. So I don't really fear the first Fajardo game. Um, the Davis Alexander development is obviously not positive because if anything goes south with Cody, then Dominic Davis is our player and he's, you know, he's our Dustin Crumb. So I'm not sure that we really want him to be starting here. So, yeah, and I'm okay. not entirely sure if it's going to affect. Alexander's availability. It's just mm. not a positive thing going on in his life. Oh, yeah, of course. So. Of course. I mean, file that under football players are human beings, too. Exactly. Department, right? So being that that being the point I've been trying to make in a clumsy way, you made it a lot better than I did. Mm -hmm. And it's too bad. It's too bad, too, because especially in the second half, Alexander looked really good for Montreal. He really looked like he was he was getting this this offense and uh he was talking some trash. So I like that. I like that. Uh, he was starting to look good last game. Um, right. Edmonton Elks. Two-point favorites at Hamilton. Um, okay, so Joe says Trey Ford might not play. I was assuming that he would be playing. Um... I don't know why Hamilton is only a two-point underdog. I don't know why 
you can be positive about Hamilton after losing pretty emphatically two games in a row to the Alouettes. Right? I mean... Well, they were playing the Alouettes, so that's what happened. Yeah, but... You know, I mean, look, the Riders played Montreal close. And I mean, hell, Toronto made him look bad. So it's not like nobody can beat the Alouettes, or at least play ball with them, you know. So, I mean, but Hamilton was not on that level. They're just not. Now, okay, maybe the pressure is off. Maybe you can take that attitude. You know, now we're loose, right? Now we can, you know, play play without stress. But And on the other side, you have the Elks. And it's just like, wow, okay, they got that. They got that boost, like the Lions presumably will with Rourke when Trey Ford was in there, and now he goes down immediately. So I don't know. I can't make heads or tails of this one. I'll do the thing where I pick the opposite of you, Joe. What do you like? Okay. CFL you can share for the Elks. I'll take the Ham- Hamilton. Maybe they're making their dead cat bounce of the season. Mm-hmm. Last okay. little bounce before they just before it all goes downhill. Yeah. <laughs> Or maybe there's a point in putting Taylor Powell in, which yeah, there very well may be. He wasn't actually all that bad last year. No, so. no, no. He was okay. He was okay, especially against Montreal defense. You know, it was a good defense, mm-hmm. but yeah, he put together some drives. He was, he was, he was okay. Um, so if okay. it's in Edmonton, maybe I think of it a different way. But in this case, especially with Ford's ability in question, Hamilton. I mean, none of these picks are easy this week. So nope, nope, no, 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 no. Especially since, again, so many of these teams are playing quarterback lottery at this point, right? Yeah. Some of these teams are just spinning the. I mean, this is this is the halfway point, right? It's coming uh, down to who's at home. Yeah, yeah. I that's gotta end at some point. Oh, it will. <laughs> I, it, I as a tiebreaker when you don't have a decision, kind of yeah. comes in handy right now. Yeah. 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 I, uh, yeah. I, I mean, like, I can't imagine Calgary 9 0 at home. I can't imagine that some of these teams are going to keep up their home record. Um, on the end, and, and by the same token, on the other hand, I can't imagine that the Alouettes will finish with a better record on the road than at home, which they still have right now. They still have yet to lose on the road. Joe says they will this week. So, all right. Uh, I think, yeah, I think I will literally cheer for the Edmonton Elks while they're still the Elks, Joe. I think maybe I should get some gear of the Elks while they're still the Elks. Yeah, it's not bad looking gear. Yeah, I might. Yeah, well, yeah. Good color scheme. I love the Elks logo. I think it's a swell logo. Um, The EE, the classic EE is still pretty nice as well, but... I really do like that minimalist uh, elk logo. Kind of like the minimalist Alouette logo as well. I like that one too. Those are nice, iconic images for gear. All right. Last game. Again, <laughs> here's the, the, the sports book thinks this is a tough one as well. Winnipeg Blue Bombers, one point underdogs at BC Lions. Uh, now, here we go, Joe. Ready? The pressure is on you on this one. Okay. Because couple of weeks ago, we had this matchup. You were like, ah, uh, that's it. I'm taking BC. BC's coming out of the bye. Winnipeg's on the short week. Well, this week, the Bombers are coming out of the bye. And the Bombers are on an 11-0 and run coming out of the bye. Okay? So, you're going to take the BC Lions again? <laughs> With maybe Nathan Rourke? I think that was my decider, honestly. Um, I am. Okay. Because A, either it's a really good luck charm for Winnipeg, or B, Nathan Rourke goes off, and that's the storyline for the rest of the season. Right. (laughs) Right. Right. Like, as a Bombers fan, how much of a nightmare is this? This game. Bombers fan? Yeah. Like, this game makes or breaks our season. I'll be honest. Um, wow. No because joke. I mean, three and even seven? if you sweep the Riders, even if you sweep the Riders. Sure. If you sweep the Riders, you have a shot at second. Right. But right. going right. into, you're going to want to 
if you can get the tiebreaker over BC, you're still in play for first. Mind you, first would have to be like 10 and 8, <laughs> but it's in play, right? Right. You lose the totally tiebreaker too. and you're 3 and 7, forget it. Your yep. best hope is second and probably third. Mm-hmm. So it's really a big change. And then you got it. You got to mark Labor Day's loss. It's just the way it always works. You're going <laughs> to split Labor Day and Badger Bowl. It's just the way it works. It's a bonus if you win Labor Day. It's a real black mark if you lose Badger Bowl. So yeah. you count that as a split. Mm-hmm. You lose that tiebreaker, most likely. Okay. Like you need this really badly if you have any hope of hosting a play- home playoff game at all. Yep. And I mean, yep. you're not normally talking this way as a three and six team, but I mean, the last five years tell you that Winnipeg didn't have the start they're used to having. Mm-hmm. They could possibly turn it on in the second half. That starts Sunday. If it happens, game on. If it doesn't, that might be all she wrote. Okay. Yeah, I was just thinking, if they win this game and then they split with the Riders, that puts them at 5-7. and seven. And Meanwhile... And Toronto's in there, too, in between, I believe. Yeah, I'm just taking those. I'm just taking those games. So you give, uh, give them a win against Toronto as well. That right. puts them at 6-7. and seven, And Calgary is playing like a 500 team. So, you know, they're in play. But yeah, it would really help if they. And you have the tiebreaker for Calgary because you went for two and got it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. In like week what? Four or five? Or like week five, six, something like that? Yes. Yes. Yeah, because, yeah, Calgary is 500 going into that game. I have Uh, a nine and nine is what's necessary. mm -hmm. And starting off uh, what you need to be six and three. Starting that off with a loss means it's six and two, and mm-hmm. you have a Labor Day coming up. Your margin of error gets really tiny really quick. Yep, 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 yep. You are right. Well, you know what? I'm gonna I'm gonna be charitable. I'm gonna give the Bombers a chance. I'll take them in this game. What the hell? Lions are still undefeated at home. You know, I'll uh, I'll fade that. I'll fade. And that. there might be that Nathan. Nathan Rourke might come in and just like give that entire franchise a boost of energy. Sure. Yeah. I'm betting against that. I'm betting yep. against that. And if, I'm, it's uh... Vancouver, if it's in Winnipeg, hmm, I feel better about it, especially after a couple weeks ago. But this one being in Vancouver with Nathan Rourke yep. coming back, that could get ugly fast. Uh, I think, yeah. I think that's uh, it's one yeah, of those gonna... teams that's either going to be twenty-one to nothing with five minutes to go in the first, uh-huh. or it's game on. Yeah, I think that again. I'm taking the contrarian view here. I'm going to take Winnipeg. I think that if Winnipeg wins, the story of the game is the defense made the key plays mm-hmm. going down the stretch. And uh, I've been waiting for that. You know, they've done it a few times this season. The Bombers have. And I think that's uh, that's what they're going to do here. I think Nathan Rourke will. I don't think Nathan Rourke will have a 400-yard game. I just don't. You know, he'll probably be really good. Uh, his accuracy will probably be, you know, 70, 75 percent, whatever. OK, fine. But I don't believe that he's going to tee off. I don't. I don't. Winnipeg yeah. Bombers defense is still pretty good. So. Yeah, and I was texting my friend in Winnipeg too when this was all going down, and it's just like we decided that, you know, <laughs> Jefferson really, really missed Nathan Rourke, and we hope that he gets to meet him quite a few times on Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> well put, well put. I hope so for my pick of uh, slate as well. Um, yeah, I think we went complete opposites, didn't we? Because it was such a hard week to this pick. Week? Yeah, this week. Yeah, I think you went all visitors. Oh my God! Did I? Yep. You well, this would, this would be the home. week for that. This would be the week for that, right? We've had a home. We've had a home sweep this season. We've had uh, an East sweep this season. So why not a visitor sweep this week? I very this much week. hope you're right. I would take zero and four next week. I'd sit there going, you know what? <laughs> totally worth it. Right. Calgary lost. <laughs> Bombers won. <laughs> There you go. Calgary loses, that. Saskatchewan loses, BC loses. Saskatchewan loses, right? Uh, BC I'm loses. 
Right? Yeah, that would be perfect for you. Uh, Winnipeg's the only team that in the West that wins this week. That would be perfect. That would be perfect for the Bombers. Okay. And then it's well, game on. Because then you're yeah. only games out. You now have your – you, you, let's say that all happens. Right. You're four and six, but you have the tiebreaker over BC and Calgary. Mm-hmm. You have the chance to get the tiebreaker for, over Saskatchewan, although – you know, as I mentioned, Labor Day is in there too, but that's not a complete black hole like it used to be. But still, that's not one you usually chalk up as a win. But you have a chance to get to get the tiebreakers back. Mm-hmm. And if you get that, and you can schedule in two losses, and you pended BC two losses recently, well, ten and eight might do it for you. Right. You. I mean. This West has been such a cluster all season that and I feel it only like really I... happened recently where BC and Saskatchewan came back to the pack once they did. Right. Right. Again, these, these two teams can't separate from one another. Calgary can't lose at home, apparently. You know, and, and Winnipeg has far too much talent to be, you know, uh discounted. So, I mean, yeah, they still don't have much of a receiver core due to injury, but well, Kenny you know, again, coming the, back. the defense is often keeping them in these games. So, mm-hmm. you know, they pitched a shutout not too long ago as well. So, you know, um, this, this West is freaking wide open. You're saying, yeah, 10 and eight is going to get you first place. It might just yet. I don't know. We'll see about Nathan Rourke. The, but well, as far as- 10 and eight is the scenario Winnipeg would need. Right. 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 Oh, but you could see, I mean, 11 and 7 winning this division is hard. At the same time, I mean, what, BC's got three, four losses right now? Yep. Yep. If Nathan Rourke is, if if the same, if if 2022 Nathan Rourke is in Vancouver right now, 13 and 5 is easily achievable. Yeah, yeah. 14 and 4 even. Well, we'll see what he looks like, but uh, we started the show with Nathan Rourke. We ended the show with Nathan Rourke, so it looks like that the winners of the off week And were... despite the colors I'm wearing, this is a fantastic get for the CFL. I hope he has... Yep. I hope he plays like 2022 Nathan Rourke for a long dang time, because that would be a lot of fun. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, it'd be great for BC, who has seen a nice resurgence in fandom since Nathan Rourke was playing there. Mm-hmm. So, and remember yeah. how the what you were mentioning before franchises change they go up and down bc was down about a decade ago weren't they they weren't in a great spot i mean they weren't in a terrible spot they weren't like right. oh we're too bad a bad season or two away from not existing or anything i mean mm-hmm. this is the 90s or anything right it isn't the 90s as much as we like the 90s but at well, the they same had, time, they were not in a place where they were competitive anymore. Right. Now look at what now look at what's going on. Yeah. Yeah. When we started this show, Wally Buono was on his last run, hmm. squeaked them into the playoffs a couple of years. They brought in Jeff Tedford for a year. They went something like seven and eleven, but still squeaked into the playoffs due to the weak East. And then after that, they were pretty much an afterthought. Yeah. Until an afterthought, until an afterthought, an afterthought in the standings and in the city. Now, yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Deck on a regular basis. Absolutely, absolutely. We had our previous commissioner then, Orridge, I believe, mm-hmm. and for some reason, uh, some of it having to do with BMO Field in Toronto. But for some reason, that was when they were putting games on Tuesday nights, Wednesday nights, and whatever, and that's just not viable in Vancouver. You can't be driving outside the city on a Wednesday night if you want your job the next day, <laughs> you know. So um, that was part of the problem, too. But everything lately, everything has been coming up B.C., except for that Grey Cup appearance and Grey Cup win. And they took so, a huge step toward it this this week. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. As, much as, coast, as much as I'd like to have the next couple of years still be blue and gold, if it's not, well... They damn well earned it. They made a good move. Hey, you had a good run. You yeah. had a good run. <laughs> uh, I would have I would have no public complaint about it. How about that? Mm-hmm. Right. I want I want that coast to coast gray cup 
this year, I want Rourke and those BC receivers against this Montreal defense. I want that, and I want Montreal to win one more back to back. After that, I'll, I'll, you know, we'll we'll take the end of decade slump. I don't care. I want one more. <laughs> I want one more, and then BC can dominate for five years after that. I want this one. I want this one. I want Mo- BC to lose in BC in the Ooh. breakup. Series. They don't do that I very do. often, you know. Oh, uh, I know. 2011. Not that I'm bitter about either of those two <laughs> for any reason. <laughs> oh, I am aware. I am aware, and they'll definitely have the home field advantage in terms of fandom. Uh, so that's that's a tough call. But that's what I'm looking at right now. We're halfway through the season. I'm looking at a Montreal BC Great Cup. Montreal has certainly separated themselves in the East. Uh, our our main enemy this year now is going to be complacency going down the stretch, like what got Toronto last year. So uh, halfway through the CFL season, let's wrap up this show. Uh, For my co-host, Joe Pritchard, I'm Oz Davis. This has been the Rouge, White, and Blue CFL podcast, a production of the Shotgun Sports Network. Enjoy the games. Talk to you next week.